Hello, and uh, we are here now ready for um, our next look, if you would. Um, our next look at uh, the integumentary system and the next special topic that kind of goes along with everything that we're talking about. Um, I promise this one is not going to be as heavy as, as the last one. Um, I do believe strongly that we have to have those types of conversations and we have to understand how our human bodies and the biology and the science of who we are and how we function and the physiology of who we are and how we function. How it has been misinterpreted and misused in society. Um, because society very often does try to control the science. And so, um, Again, we need to have those conversations and we will have those conversations um, because that's, that's what I'm here for. That is, that is my role. It's not just to give you what's in the textbook, but it's to force you beyond that, force you out of your comfort zone um, to be able to critically think and evaluate and truly understand from a multi-directional perspective about what is and what is not. Um, so again, I, I know that was a little bit of a heavy video. Um, this next video is gonna be a little bit more lighthearted, I think, um, kind of give you a little bit different of a perspective of some of these glands that we have talked about and looked at. Um, you all know that, uh, well, if you don't know, you, you will know. Um, I, I teach a specialty course, special topics course, uh, each spring called uh, Biology of Sexuality and Gender. Um, Looking at the evolution of human sexuality is something that um, I find fascinating and is an area of study that um, I consider to be one of my air, my expertise areas um, as an evolutionary biologist. Um, I am most interested in, in how we as a species developed our sexuality. Um, and so part of that is ingrained within our skin, as oddly as that may or may not sound. And so uh, during this video, this is exactly what we're going to be looking at, uh, is how does our skin uh, kind of lead us to our sexuality? Um, we know from, uh, from lab that there are two types of uh, sweat glands or, or pseudoriferous glands. Uh, we have our merocrine glands. These are your typical run-of-the-mill uh, run glands, like your ecrine glands. Uh, but then we have these apocrine glands as well. Uh, and these apocrine glands don't typically uh, develop, they don't typically mature until in and around starting around the age of eight, maybe nine, um, as late as, as 10 years old. Uh, and these apocrine glands, which are sweat glands, uh, mature within areas of like the groin, the anal region, axillary underneath the, the arms, the areola, uh, the colored area around the nipple. Um, in males, mature males within the bearded area, we tend to have a lot more concentration of these apocrine glands. Um, and the sweat that they produce is this thicker, milkier uh, uh, sweat uh, that contains these fatty acids in which bacteria will feed on and break down. And that is why when you walk into uh, a middle school classroom that have Six or seven, or sixth graders or seventh graders, it smells like an Italian sub shop, right? Because they're not using deodorant and they're at that age again, eight, nine, ten years old. Um, they're at that age where uh, these, these apocrine glands are fully developing and they're secreting this, this thicker, fattier um, uh, sweat byproduct. Um, and, and part of the, the, part of the reason for that is because, uh, once puberty sets in, one of the other things that are released from these apocrine glands is something that is referred to as, uh, pheromones, all right, pheromones. Um, I will say that, you know, a lot of the times the sweat that we secrete from the merocrine glands are designed to uh, a cool the body, but because of the salt content within them, 
uh, it actually restricts bacterial growth. The apocrine glands have a completely different purpose, which is why they have delayed um, uh, activity right, within the body. They are designed as a tool of our sexuality. All right. Um, and again, at puberty or in and around puberty, uh, these glands also start to secrete, these glands also start to secrete um, these chemicals called pheromones. They're not fairy tale, they're not actually fake. These are real chemicals that we admit, and it's the driving force of the perfume, the multi-billion dollar a year uh, industry globally. Um, is the production of these perfumes, of deodorants, of lotions, uh, and it's all geared towards attracting, typically, the opposite sex. Um, and, and it's funny because you always you always hear about these pheromones from the perspective of the male. Right now, um, Andrew Stadinon, uh, I can never say that, Andrew Stadinon. Uh, is the male pheromone, all right? Androstenol, which is the pheromone down here, this is the female pheromone. Now, ironically, um, a male, a male will secrete the pheromone, androstadonanon, and when the male releases that pheromone, it is for the specific attention of the female. Females, if I have not mentioned this yet this semester, females are the stronger sex. I did, I think I mentioned it in, in lecture one or two, going all the way back to chapter one. Right? Females are the weaker sex. Well, part of their greatness is their sense of smell is actually better they have more olfactory receptors within their nasal passages than what males do. They can detect and they have more sensitivity to a larger variety of smells than what males do. Part of that is the detection of these pheromones. And so um, very often females are attracted to a male and, and ladies, you've probably had this, like, my God, what did I ever, what did I see in them? But ugly, yeah, it might be a good sense of humor, but I don't understand why I'm attracted. It was the chemical stimulation that was there. There was a chemical attraction with the pheromones that was being released from this individual. Um, and so there is, there is some, uh, some logistics and some truth to this idea that pheromones are this powerful sex tool. Uh, in fact, one of the things that we know about homosexual men is that they are more sensitive to this male pheromone than what they are anything else. And so in homosexual men, um, they also respond to the release of this pheromone, not just heterosexual females. Um, now, on the flip side of that, right, females release androstenol. Right? And here's here's the thing with that with the female pheromone, males can't detect it. Let that one sink in. Males don't detect the female pheromone, and so why would the female then release the pheromone? The answer is rooted in evolution. Male competition, reproductive advantage. This is why the female releases androstenol or the, male, the female pheromone. Follow, follow the logic here, right? follow the logic here. Females have concealed ovulation. So guys, as a, as a guy, we don't typically know when you as a female are ovulating. We don't know when that egg is gonna be released. All right. You have complete power in that. Right? You have sexual power over your reproductive ability. You know when it's happening. We're stupid. All right. So you are you are getting ready to ovulate. Your estrogen levels are starting to rise. Your progesterone levels are starting to rise. 
your luteinizing hormones are starting to rise, the follicles are starting to mature, the egg is getting ready to rupture, you start to increase your secretion of androstenol. And it's a warning shot to the females around you. Getting ready to ovulate. Reproductively fertile. Back off. The guys that are around us first dibs. And she's saying this to all the other females around her. Without ever saying a word. The other females can sense and detect the androstenol. And the, when they detect that androstenol, guess what androstenol does within the females? It works to inhibit ovulation within the other females. So it actually is an egg blocker. Blocks the other females from being able to ovulate, giving that main female the reproductive advantage. Even if a male does try to re-hook up with that other girl, she ain't ovulating. She's going for the guy. But she ain't ovulating. She doesn't have that reproductive power. But here's the thing. The other females, their hormone levels rise above the threshold of androstenol, and they can still ovulate. Ladies. You ever work in a place where there's all females? Maybe one poor guy. Or maybe Polk State isn't your first stint at college. And maybe you, were, you went away to a university and you lived in a dorm where there was 150 or 175 other females on the floor living with you. What happened? Your cycles synced up. what we call the dormitory effect. Why is that? Your cycles were syncing up because you're all detecting each other's pheromone trying to block each other from ovulating, which drives the hormones level higher, which makes you a little bit more aggressive. You notice that you kind of get catty in and around ovulation? Those hormone levels get pushed way up. And you go into, subconsciously, your evolutionary primitive brain kicks in and you say, I need that reproductive advantage. And I want to sleep with him because I like him. And I want to sleep with him because I like him. And just in case, I'm going to sleep with him as well. Uh, what you doing Friday, what you doing Saturday afternoon, what you doing Saturday night? And there's evolutionary advantage to that. There's evolutionary advantage to having an increased selection of the male to potentially fertilize an egg that has been ovulated. And remember, you have no way to attract that guy except you start maybe wearing some high heels. Maybe the skirt gets a little shorter. Maybe the top button gets unbuttoned. Maybe you're doing a little bit more of the hair flip. Maybe you don't ever wear mascara and all of a sudden you're starting to put on some mascara. You've got ways because we're visual. We're, we're, not, we're not smellers. We're, we're visual curators here. We're reading the visual signals and you're chemically communicating with the other women around you saying back off. And the reason why you want to go ahead and you want to hook up with this one on Friday and this one on Saturday afternoon and this one on Saturday nights is because you're testing out the sperm to see what's more compatible with you biologically. See, your body has the ability because it treats the sperm as a foreign invader. Your immune system immediately starts this inflammatory response that begins to attack sperm that's not compatible with your biochemistry. And so you're depositing sperm and sperm and sperm to see which one your body's going to respond to more. 
And the one that you are more compatible with is going to be the one that you're going to select. And when the egg is ovulated, it secretes a chemical messenger that says, yo! Right fallopian tube. And the sperm come up into the cervix. They enter into the uterus and they head for the left fallopian tube because they got the chemical message. all rooted in pheromones. We secrete the pheromones to get the women because they don't care what we look like. Well, maybe that's not completely true. They're being attracted by your sense. Because they're a little bit better than you are. And the pheromones they're sending out are to keep the other women at bay, even though it promotes reproductive evolution, comp evolutionary competition between the females. You're going to ovulate first, but I'm going to be six hours behind you, and I'm going to pick up your sloppy, slop, sloppy seconds. I'm going to be hooking up with this one, this one, and this one, but you can have that one, that one, and that one. <laughs> See, as a, as, as a species, I would argue that we are not monogamous as a species. Our biology, our pheromones, our physiology has designed us, has pointed us into an evolutionary direction of being promiscuous species. To some of you, that might be an uncomfortable thought. <laughs> these lectures are all about making you be uncomfortable, about having these tough conversations and these tough, tough thoughts. Maybe we're not supposed to be monogamous. I would take that a step further and say, maybe we're not supposed to be using sex primarily for reproduction and maybe it's a method of social bonding. which would be the advantage of the male secreting the pheromone to attract multiple females. Our biochemistry drives who we are as a species. We can deny our evolutionary heritage, but it doesn't invalidate it. It doesn't change it. It complicates it, but it doesn't change it. Um, for those that were wondering where and how, how we, uh, the synthesis pathway <laughs> of uh, these pheromones, guess what? These pheromones, these male and female pheromones are derivatives of, well, these are types of steroids. And in fact, cholesterol gets converted into progesterone, which is primarily a female hormone. I think males produce it as well, but um, here we produce the male hormone, or I'm sorry, yeah, the male pheromone, right? And we can eventually even convert that into the female pheromone as well. Um, and so all of these things, these, this is all related to the, our steroids. It's all related to steroids. Um, so things to ponder. I cannot wait to our next class time together because I'm sure the questions and the conversations are going to be deep and thought provoking because I'm sure you guys are jotting down questions left and right. And this is just a little note on uh, sebaceous glands. It has nothing to do with pheromones, but pheromones is a good thing. Um, and so with that, um, I will go ahead and I will leave you to uh, kind of ponder about these two videos and to go through um, the integumentary system notes module that I have posted uh, for you in uh, this week's module. And uh, I look forward to the discussions this week that we're going to have. Um, and with that said,
Uh, keep studying, keep asking those questions. And now I'll touch you on the flip side.